Hello. <clears throat> well, today I'm going to talk about Apocalypse Now. The, uh, 40, which is now 40 years old. I don't have the 40th anniversary uh, Blu-ray, which is 4K Blu-ray. I have the full disclosure uh, edition, which has a theatrical cut, the Redux, and the Art of Darkness documentary. Um, I do know that uh, the final cut, as it's called, the final cut, <clears throat> as it's called, is longer than the theatrical cut, and um, but shorter than the Redux. Um, it's, it's interesting uh, how you know it's one of those films that you know, has so many cuts of the film now. Though now I guess three technically, but you know I mean it's not like Blade Runner or Star Wars or anything like that where there's so many different cuts of the movie that you know pick and choose which one do you like better. Um, uh, I don't know when I'll get the uh, 40th anniversary one. Um, there I just know when it came out. Or this summer, there was too many things uh, coming out, and uh, that I also wanted to get. I think Avengers: Endgame was one of those films, so got that. And also, I don't really look at the 4K uh, versions of films since I don't have a 4K TV, um, nor a player to play it on. But you know, that's just. Uh, that, I guess that's beside the point. Anyway, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, Apocalypse Now. Martin Sheen is Captain uh, Willard, and he uh, is assigned to kill uh, Colonel Kurtz, uh, played by Marlon Brando. Uh, he has gone insane and has killed many people. Along the way, uh, on his journey to get to where Kurtz is, he's like deep in the jungle of Vietnam. He meets various uh, people, including uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Kilgore, played by Robert Duvall, who is one of the most memorable characters of this film, and has the most memorable line of the whole film. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Um, you know, that's one of those that ranks up with uh, you talking to me. Um, but that wasn't an, uh, that wasn't improvised. Uh, at least not, not that I you know, you know not that I'm aware of uh, from the interviews and stuff from this. It seems like that's something straight up, <clears throat> straight out of uh, like a. John Milius' script, um, because John Milius and Francis Ford Coppola wrote this film, um, and uh, but there are certain changes Coppola made to the script that uh, where he got to, you know, obviously be co-author of the script, um, and uh, there, there, it's an interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting film. It's a very good film. Um, you know, one of the best of 79. Um, many say this deserved the Best Picture Oscar, as well as director and screenplay. And I can I can kind of uh, uh, understand and see why. Uh, I think I would actually probably agree with that. Um, though there are other films nominated that I did like. You know, I liked all that jazz. thought that was a very good film. And I thought, uh, you know, Kramer vs. Kramer was very good. Um, which is the winner that year, but, you know, it was one of those films that, while it's a good film, um, there were other movies like Apocalypse Now, uh, which are talked about a lot more than Kramer vs. Kramer. Um, and Apocalypse Now really is a story of Descent into Madness. There's a, you know, the deeper... 
Willard get goes into the jungle, you know, and the more action and everything he sees, um, he begins to go mad. And, um, you know, this, this uh, film is uh, based on the novella, uh, Heart of Darkness, which explores that, you know, theme, the you know, going mad. And uh, in, in the fact that this was set in a Vietnam you know, setting, I think in a way is a, sort of helps sell that because, you know, in war, war can bring out the best in people as well as the worst. Um, some people stay good throughout the en entire duration of a war. Others uh, can go bad or maybe mad, and, you know, and... We see the uh, effects or takes on uh, Willard as he um, <clears throat> goes through the film. He really, you know, it takes a toll on him, and uh, it's it's one of those. I don't know. It's just one of those stories that you know it seems very realistic. It seems like this is a pretty good rendition or of depiction of what the Vietnam War was like in a certain way. Um, obviously, you know, there are films like Platoon, which is more based on uh, Oliver Stone's actual experience uh, in the war. He was a Vietnam veteran, and uh, Platoon is essentially his story, but obviously there are liberties taken here and there with certain characters and what happens to certain characters. Um, and, uh, this movie was uh, a film that took uh, quite some time to make. John Milius uh, wanted to try and adapt uh, Heart of Darkness, but he also wanted to make a Vietnam War film. That was a big thing back then. He also wanted to enlist in the Vietnam War but he had asthma and he couldn't, and he kind of thought, eh, that's, that's kind of stupid, and, you know, there's some, you know, in, in a way, that there's a bit of a frustration he had, but he took his desire to have wanted to try and, you know, fight for his country and everything of that sort, and then did what he could to try and make his own film uh, based off of what, you know, the veterans that were, who have come back from the war, as well as uh, just various other things, you know, things that he's heard and talked to people and all that sort of thing one would uh, 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 do for research upon tackling a film like this. And, uh, Initially, George Lucas was supposed to be the director. He also was helping uh, Milius in the early stages of writing the script, so he might have had a hand in sort of writing process of sorts. And originally, it was supposed to be like a guerrilla filmed uh, type movie, going to Vietnam. Like they were going to originally going to make a folks documentary where. They go to Vietnam and, uh, while the war is still going on and everything and just shoot a fake documentary and make it like, oh, this is real and all that. And uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think George Lucas, from if I recall correctly, was too fond of that idea because he would have to go to Vietnam, He'd be the director and everything and while the war is going on, and he just didn't think that would have been the best thing, because Coppola, while being the producer, he would have been back in uh, America, in San Francisco. So, yeah, George Lucas doesn't seem to be too keen on that idea, but anyway, uh, as time went on, the development of the script changed. And, um, yeah, some other notable people that are in this film uh, include... Harrison Ford, at the very beginning, he uh, 
when he when Willard is getting his assigned mission. Uh, he plays uh, Colonel G. Lucas. Colonel Lucas. He got to even. Excuse me. Uh, 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 my research is correct. He chose his name. He chose his own name, and he'd worked with George Lucas on, you know, American Graffiti and Star Wars. He was also a good. Lucas is a good friend of Coppola's. I was supposed to be the director of this film, so. You know, that name is very, it's a very interesting choice of the name for a character in this movie. The original director who has some connections to it. Uh, not just being a friend to the director, writer, producer, but uh, the actor as well. Um, clearly, I guess, Harrison Ford, like George Lucas enough uh, to... Uh, have that be his character's name, you know, while he might uh, not have been the biggest fan of certain uh, lines of dialogue in Star Wars, uh, seemed to, uh, you know, and people can kind of say, oh, he's kind of a, Harrison Ford's kind of grumpy and this and that. Well, clearly he liked George Lucas enough to have that, his name essentially be his character's name in this movie, even though it's a very brief role. Um... Lawrence Fishburne is in this movie. He lied about his age. He said he was 15 or so when he uh, began to film the movie. He was like 13 or so. But by the time the movie came out, he actually was 15. Um, uh, Dennis Hopper uh, plays a photojournalist. And um, he, he, he just, he's very very energetic and very like uh, it's clear he's sort of like a as one of journalists who's sort of like also like doped up on whatever he get his hands on and everything and I mean, I mean that's completely unlike Dennis Hopper obviously you know he was never like that in real life uh, yeah he it's interesting to see how all these uh, you know, big names, either back then or now, uh, or in this film. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, Martin Sheen was a rising star. Badlands came out before this film. and um, This movie had a big, uh, a, a troubled production. Um, you know, George Lucas was supposed to direct it, but, you know, after his first film, DHX 138, failed... Uh, they had to recess everything and what they were going to do. And Lucas later made American Graffiti. And Coppola made Godfather 1 and 2, as well as the conversation in between those movies. And by, by the time both were very popular and very you know, established, essentially, um, as well as Milius, he helped... Uh, he wrote some stuff for... Uh, <coughs> Dirty Harry. He didn't get credit, but he sort of like punched up the dialogue here and there. He also wrote Magnum Force, the sequel to Dirty Harry, and also wrote dialogue for Jaws. Uh, very notably, uh, he uh, helped rewrite the Indianapolis speech. Um, you know, so all these guys' careers were very well established, so finally by the time it came to make American Gra or Apocalypse Now, not American Graffiti uh, not talking about that movie, but when it came time to do Apocalypse Now which would be like, okay we're all essentially popular now, we're all pretty established in terms of our, with our careers and what we do now we can make Apocalypse Now well, George Lucas got a deal to do Star Wars, which was something he had thought of for quite some time, and he grasped at that opportunity, so and that actually sort of strained their friendship for a while. Um, uh, uh, obviously, in 1980, they both Lucas and Coppola were executive producers on a film to help get it released uh, more 
wider release. Uh, I forget the name of that film. It'll probably come to me later on. Uh, or in the comments if you know it, you can you know, uh, write it in if you'd like. But So by the 1980, it seems like things had cooled down and they were uh, friends again, or at least their friendship was mending. Um, but the, the production again was very uh, took very long, quite a quite some time to get from the moment of the inception of the idea to finally getting it into the bit on, into the theaters. Coppola himself, you know, in the jungles where they were filming um, like the Philippines it was incredibly hot and he uh, lost quite a lot of weight I believe he lost like uh, over a hundred pounds um, and Martin Sheen you know notably had a heart attack even though they had to say he didn't have a heart attack he had like heat stroke it was incredibly hot just didn't drink enough water and everything Martin Sheen's children were there with him. You know, Billy Westavez, Charlie Sheen, and all those kids were there, and that had to be a very, you know, frightening uh, experience for not just the whole cast and crew, but for his family who was there. You know, it's <clears throat> that would be very unfortunate to witness. Al Pacino was at one point offered to be in uh, in this film as Willard's part, but uh, <laughs> he declined because he uh, didn't want to spend uh, at that point like seven months in the jungle with Coppola. He also in in the like in Havana, you know, in the scenes of Cuba. If, uh, you know, when they were filming Godfather Two, he. Uh, got sick and he just didn't want to have to deal with anything like that again so we passed um, I believe Steve McQueen was considered at one point uh, I guess either he passed or just didn't get an answer I can't recall if uh, that was true I could be thinking of another movie that Steve McQueen was thought of for but he was very popular obviously um, he passed away uh, a year after this film came out, unfortunately. Um, quite young, you know, he's 50. But also, um, Harvey Keitel was uh, Willard at one point. He even went, they went so far as to actually film scenes, but it, like they didn't think he was right, and he got recast with Martin Sheen. And, you know, Sheen stuck it out throughout the whole the shooting process, even with having a heart attack. You know, I, I can't see anybody in that part but Sheen. I guess I could possibly see Al Pacino. I don't know, I guess that's just sort of a character that I could just see him play. Not sure about Harvey Keitel or Steve McQueen. But, yeah, I think uh, Martin Sheen did a fantastic job. Um... um <clears throat> Robert Duvall got nominated for an Academy Award for Supporting Actor. I actually think he should have won. Uh, Melvin Douglas, I believe, won the Oscar for you know being there. Uh, yes, that was him. Yes, Melvin Douglas. Yeah, he won. Yeah, he won that year. Um, he was very good in that film. That was a very good performance by him. But, yeah, it was... It, for me, uh, Duvall was... He gave a better performance, I think. Um, and again, as I've mentioned before, in terms of like awards, can't tie, which I think is, at times, really stupid. Sometimes it's like you have just two people who are just so good, you can't not give both an award 
that the Academy doesn't like to have ties anymore for acting, so I seriously doubt that will ever happen again. <clears throat> like Jeff Frederick March and Wallace Berry tied and uh, Barbara Streisand and Katherine Hepburn tied. Um, just doesn't seem like they will. That will ever happen. Um, but yeah, uh, this movie is really good. It's a fantastic film. If I ever see the final cut, um, I will. I might do another video. Might give my thoughts <coughs> on it. Might compare the versions, maybe. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I. I do like the Redux. I know some, I've heard some aren't too fond of the Redux. Um, might add so much, might, some think it adds unnecessary material. Um, <clears throat> I just think it's just, uh, I think stuff like, uh, like director's cuts, or in this case, the Redux, I think it's really good. I think it just adds more to the story. It's really interesting. Um, one thing they added was Kilgore, uh, Helping a mother and child um, to safety, you know, innocent people who, um, at the time, you know, when they had that attack on the beach and everything, you know, there were innocent people there, and he's very concerned. He's not like somebody who's just cold-blooded and just hates everybody there, which seems to be like a uh, a very uh, seemed to be a sentiment uh, at the time that people were horrible. To everybody over in Vietnam, and they actually didn't seem to like care much at all about any of the innocent people. Um, even though at times, you know, it was hard to see who was on your side, who was the South Vietnamese, who were essentially the allies to the Americans. And, you know, who 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 was the North? You know, the essentially the opposing side in this situation. Um, but that you know that scene really showed that. You know, Kilgore, despite him saying that someday this war is going to end, then walking off looking very sad about that fact. Like, he's somebody who was built for war. He was built to be a fighter, be a soldier. And that realization, this war will end, and then I'll have nothing after this. There's nothing for me after this. This is what I've been, this is what I have been living to towards. I'm here, I have to take, I have to grasp this as it is. You know, this is, this is my only moment where I will pretty much shine in my life. You know, no matter what other accomplishments I'll have, you know, getting married, having kids. It's just something that after this is over, my high point will be gone and I'll never get a chance to grasp it again, so... But he does seem to care. He does care. He does care about innocent lives. He doesn't want those who <clears throat> were innocent bystanders in the conflict between these fac factions fighting. You know, and that's a moment that I think is very nice. You know, yeah, but, you know, some just aren't fond of the Redux, I know. Um, sometimes, you know, it could be because it's long. It's over three hours long. Um... So, I can understand that. Sometimes length, you know, movies are, can kind of have a, like a director's cut that's even longer. You know, maybe a movie itself is already long, but now here's an even longer version. And some might just think this was this is just unnecessary. But I think Apocalypse Now is one of those movies that it just, it's, it's very good, regardless of the version you see. Again, I've never seen the f final cut. So maybe I'll think that's a better cut. You know, that's very possible. I'm wondering what um, <clears throat> what is included. I heard some things were included in it, uh, some new things, and things were removed. Like okay. it's very interesting. I'm surprised at first uh, Coppola didn't get this version that he wanted, but he did his essentially his director's cut of this uh, with the Redux. The first time, um, I don't know. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's really it. Um, yeah. Uh, so, what do you think? What do you think about this movie? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Um, <clears throat> if you like, you can give me your thoughts in the comments. 
or you don't have to, you know, whatever. Uh, it's your life, really. You can do what you want. So with that, I will um, see you all next time. Hope you all have a good day, have a good weekend, have a good week. And uh, yeah, take care. Bye.